man's willing to drop the charges if you just hand over the kid. You can't hand her back to them. Why not? Because it isn't safe. Kathleen Turner is a big city detective trying to solve the murder of an athlete while taking care of his young daughter in V.I. Warshawski. One of five new summer movies we're going to be reviewing this week on Siskel and Ebert. I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. And I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. Our first movie is named after a Chicago private eye named V.I. Warshawski, who is the heroine of a series of mystery novels by Sarah Paretsky. V.I. is a private eye in the hard-boiled tradition of Sam Spade and Philip Marlowe, a woman with a lot of cynicism, idealism, and self-confidence. For example, when she finds herself in a singles bar with a good-looking former hockey star. What's your name? V.I. Warshawski. V.I. Yeah. What does V stand for? Virtuous. <laughs> In a manner of speaking. You're a funny lady. Try beautiful. It works much better, believe me. The hockey player asked her to take care of his daughter, and although she doesn't usually babysit, she likes him, and so she does. And then the guy is killed in an explosion, and together, Warshawski and the young girl go looking for the killer. The trail leads to physical danger. You've always had a big mouth, Warshawski. You know, you really ought to try listening for once. Hmm? Okay, I'll listen. You got something to say? You're just rounding up all the private eyes in Chicago in order to show them how tough you are. I guess it's an unwritten law of private eye movies that the detective has a friend on the police force, someone to constantly and uselessly warn them to stay out of trouble. You don't have a clue, do you? Well, I know Trumbull's the man behind it. You ought to lock him up. On what grounds? Woman's intuition? The best thing about the movie, I think, is Kathleen Turner's performance. She's a growing up woman here, sexy but wise in the ways of the world, with a laugh cured by whiskey and a romantic streak that has survived a lot of disappointment. It's a change of pace for Turner, who has an infectious sense of humor about the role that's kind of catching. Well, boy, I didn't like this picture at all. No? Like, Turner wasn't the problem. She's okay, but everybody else associated with the picture, I mean, everybody else, particularly the men that she meets, straight up and down the line, all the brothers involved in the real estate uh -huh. scandal and all that, I thought they were one dullard after another. I didn't think that they were attractive actors. I thought the friend, the reporter, was a complete bore. I didn't think anybody was interesting that she met whatsoever. I think she could be an interesting character if you put her in an interesting case. The case was boring. The people she met was boring. I was really thought it was a bad film. You didn't like the guy who played the reporter? Not at all. Uh... I thought he had no... I thought it was a real stock character. Not TV movie quality, TV soap opera quality, except that with soap operas, they're so outlandish that it's almost a uh, campfire. I don't know. I don't know where to start. We're so far no, apart we are on very this. far apart. She is so vibrant in this movie. She has so much fun. Now, you got to realize, Gene, it's not supposed to be a comedy. I mean, it's supposed to have a little bit of an edge to it. It's supposed to be... Uh, what are you looking at me like it's that It's not for? supposed to be a comedy? No, I, I don't th think so. I think a lot of it's played I for I think laughs. it's supposed to be a private eye movie. I don't think it's... I, I, felt, I felt that she was never in danger at all. I thought it was a very light what? touch to this. What about all that stuff at the end involving the sinking boat and so forth? I thought that... I didn't think that the kid... I thought it was like cartoonish. I thought there was a, a cheap uh, script, uh, a very lightweight cast surrounding her, not imaginably directed. I didn't think our city looked very good. I didn't like oh, anything but Our her. city didn't look very good. Our no. city looked terrific. No. No. I'm in total disagreement with you. Review the next movie. Well, it's a little bit better than V.I. Warshawski. And our next movie is called Trust, and it's the new film from the offbeat writer-director Hal Hartley, who in his last picture, The Unbelievable Truth, and this one creates melodramas that are really soap operas with just snappier dialogue. Hartley again uses sex pot actress Adrian Shelley as the centerpiece of his story about Maria, a pregnant teenager who was thrown aside by her boyfriend. As the film opens, Maria is badgering her dad for money. Dad, give me five dollars. Listen to me, young lady. I've had just about all I'm going to take. Mom, what's he talking about? Give me five dollars. So listen to your father when he's talking to you. Well, what's he talking about? You know damn well what I'm talking about. Maria, you've been thrown out of school. I was not thrown out. I quit. Now give me five dollars. The joke, of course, is that she is, and we're supposed to be smarter than dear old dad, who will die of a heart attack. The new man in Maria's life is a disaffected computer worker named Matthew, played by Martin Donovan. Again, the joke is, the establishment characters are real adults, while the rebels are cool. This crap isn't worth the time we put into it. What's wrong with it? It's cheap. So? Cheap! Well, can't you fix it? No. Why not? Some things shouldn't be fixed. 
When Matthew and Maria are together, he knocks the establishment even more, including high school. I decided to go back to high school. Why? Because I don't want to work in a factory. When we get married, you won't have to work at all. Well, I want to, just not in a factory. How can you go to high school pregnant? Plenty of girls do it. Now, a little of this stuff went a long way for me. These are attractive actors to look at, and some of their lines are funny, but the general attitude of the picture never changes. The result is a smug comedy that, frankly, I didn't care for that much. You know, I know what you mean by that, and I, I was disappointed by the movie, too. Everything that we absorb in the first five minutes tells us everything else correct. is going to happen in the movie. That is correct. And so if that's the only idea that there is, then that should, the movie should be five minutes long because it's a rigid attitude that is simply applied uh, almost as if it were a work rule to everything else that goes on during the film. And you just sit there watching it repeat itself. So what the writer has done, and the guy has some talent. I mean, yeah. these, are, these are fresh young people that he's using, and it's shot in an interesting way. But he's really just doing variations on this little schematic of uh, establishments are dummies and the kids are hip. Okay, four young gangsters take over the mob and rewrite criminal history in Mobsters. That's later in the show. Coming up next, Mel Brooks's comedy about the homeless, Life Stinks. Hot two, hot two, zig the bean bomb boom hot two. Oh, center. It's absolutely visionary. Fantastic. Incredible. Gentlemen, you never know how much this project excites me. Mel Brooks plays a Los Angeles land developer who wants to tear down a poor section of L.A. and replace it with his own vision of the future in Life Stinks a new comedy that's a change of pace for Brooks. After making some of the funniest, but also some of the silliest films of the last 20 years, he allows life stinks to get just a little serious underneath the laughs. It's a surprisingly heartwarming comedy. In the movie, he makes a bet that he can survive for 30 days in the ghetto with no money and no credit cards, all on his own. Take it, take it all. Won't need anything. And you won't need this either. So, okay, even if you are the world's wealthiest man, which Brooks is supposed to be in this movie, how do you survive if you're suddenly broke and living on the streets? Morning, sir. Hey, 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 get away from my car. What are you doing? Oh, just cleaning your windshield, sir. Cleaning my windshield, you made it worse. <laughs> yeah, that better? Brooks makes a friend of a bag lady who lives in an alley, and she's played by Leslie Ann Warren as a philosopher about life, death, and poverty. The movie's big romantic scenes shows them using fantasy to break out of their world and into the world of an old-fashioned Technicolor musical. That's a very sweet scene there, a warm-hearted one. And one thing that Brooks always seems to include in his movies is some kind of song and dance routine, even if it has to be kind of dragged in, kicking and screaming. What was interesting about this movie was the way Brooks uses humor as a weapon of social commentary. The next time a guy tries to wipe off my windshield in order to make some change, I'm going to have to think of this movie and ask myself, what else can this guy really do to survive since society has turned its back on him and he has no resources? The basic plot idea in Life Stinks is similar to the 1941 Preston Sturges film, Sullivan's Travels, which starred Joel McRae as a Hollywood director who becomes a bum to see how the other half lives. The big difference between then and now is that life on the streets has gotten worse, not better. Well, I didn't laugh that much for, uh, very much in this picture, uh, Roger. That's, that's one criticism that I have. Um, there was one great joke, though, where the, at, at the end, the home, one of the homeless guys, where they're being displaced, uh, says uh, we're, we're, they force us to live in crap and now they're taking the crap away mm -hmm. which I thought was a good a real good essential line but other than that I didn't have any big laughs in the film and I'm gonna use your other test now of the windshield wiper because mm -hmm. I use that test in judging movies a lot uh, uh, social commentary films when I leave the theater does my behavior change even for like a half an hour or so mm -hmm. after the theater do I notice if it's about a minority group do I notice them differently coincidentally after I saw this picture the first time I, I did see a homeless person walk by me, and I would have thought that I would have given them money, because I do that from time to time. Mm -hmm. I didn't. 
and I was surprised, and I thought, you know, I didn't, I knew I didn't like the picture that much, and it didn't even cause me to do that. So that's, and that's a little. Well, let me respond to that because sure. one interesting sequence in this movie involves this guy standing there with no money in his pockets, and he's hungry, and he needs to make money. Now, yeah. what can he do? He can wash a windshield. He can do a little song and dance on the sidewalk. I think that if you put a very smart person, like a guy who could make six billion dollars, mm -hmm. clever in that way, out on the streets, I think his behavior would be different. In other words, I don't think they wrote a smart enough script. Words, I think you Brooks, do, I think you would do Brooks, better if you had to spend 30 days living on the streets. I, I would hope I would. I probably, you know what? <laughs> I'd do either better or I'd do a lot worse. And you see, I think he stayed in the comic middle, uh -huh. a kind of you know, routine, uh, old-fashioned comedy middle and didn't challenge the real exciting possibilities of that situation today. Okay, coming up next, a look at the early days of the thugs who founded America's Mafia. Christian Slater and Patrick Dempsey lead the youthful cast of Mobsters. It's time to play with the big boys. You changed. You're not listening to your friends no more. <laughs> Listen to you. You let Mad Dog Carl live. He's already killed on Rothstein, and who knows who's next? Christian Slater there as young Lucky Luciano, and Patrick Dempsey is young Meyer Lansky in the new movie Mobsters, about a quartet of young thugs on the make who founded the modern American mafia, knocking off their peers and playing one old style Don against another. Unfortunately, with this big star cast, this is a picture that recycles every mob movie cliche you've ever seen. Here, the two young hoods meet with a sponsor, notorious gambler Arnold Rothstein, played by F. Murray Abraham. What's the secret of America? What's the matter with this guy? I'm 24 years old. I'm the money! Everything is money, Charlie. Don't ever forget it. That's Lucky Luciano pays a visit to one of the old Dons, Don Maseria, Anthony Quinn, chewing up the scenery, and they do a dance of courting each other, seeing if they can find a common ground to combat a rival old Don. You belong in this family. Someday I will join you, Joe. You don't like uh, today? No, no, I don't like it. Oh, it's too bad, Charlie. You know... I've seen a lot come and a lot go. Guys just like you. The ones who come, they come to me. The ones who go, sometimes... <laughs> I'm the guy who sends them off. As the film progresses, we meet one famous mobster after another as a young man. Here's a confrontation with Mad Dog Cole. One of the problems with this movie is that you have to know every character's name for it to hold any significance whatsoever. You see, by the old way of doing things, I should let Benny shoot you in the head right now. But I'm not going to do that. So you're not going to kill me. So? So we have a problem. Name. He's dead! I didn't care at all for mobsters. In fact, I realized early on, as I pictures started rolling, that I had overdosed on mob material, especially the standard glamorous treatment that goes on here. We've seen it all before. The vicious portrayals, the period clothes, the beautiful dames, the food, the gunplay, the crooked cops, the political infighting. There is nothing surprising here. Mobsters was filmed by a first-time movie director who previously had been shooting commercials. This looks like an ad for the mafia. I was bored throughout. Uh, I don't recommend it either. I may have liked it a little more than you did because I thought it was a good-looking movie. And I thought that Christian Slater, a fine young actor in movies he is a like fine Pump Up actor. the Volume, is very convincing as L Lucky Luciano. The two real criticisms I had are, first of all, the plot is so complicated in which they're figuring this you know in order to kill this guy yeah, right. we have to get his trust and in order to get his trust we'll have to fake trying to kill him and protect him and then if we save his life he'll trust okay. us and then we can kill him and this this kind of reasoning goes on it's like but, but let me tell you uh, a bunch of uh, yeah. philosophy teachers trying to figure it out the other criticism i had was the level of the bloodshed which i thought almost approached parody there is so much blood, so much violence in this movie, it's out of balance. I'll ask this question. You know, uh, Martin Scorsese with Goodfellas, I think, mm -hmm. raised the stakes on American yeah. gangster pictures. Mm -hmm. What is this picture's attitude? What's the point? And I'll tell you what, I think, I think it has a very cynical attitude. We're going to make a mob film for young moviegoers with a younger cast. Yeah, young guns. Young guns, uh, young guns in the city. The godson instead of the godfather. Well, at the end, of course, they have the crawl on the screen where they tell you what happened to these four right. guys. And gee, it, you know, it sounds like of, American graffiti. Yeah, it's fun. Sort of successful, yeah. 
Meyer Lasky never even went to jail. Pictures died rich and the picture uh, happy. has no moral attitude. It is a rather cynical shot at the young movie going audience. Coming up next, a strange new film named Slacker, in which one thing just sort of leads to another. It's about the neo beatniks of Austin, Texas. I may live badly, but at least I don't have to work to do it. From Touchstone Pictures, he was a successful surgeon who became an ordinary patient. I'll check you out. You're a gynecologist. So? Drop your pants. <laughs> now he's taking on the system. Do you suppose you could get me a thinner sheet? I'm not sure everyone can see through this one. And the doctors. Are you going to fit a little prick? Please, doctor, we've only just met. Don't miss the movie Siskel and Ebert give two thumbs up. William Hurt, The Doctor, rated PG-13. Starts Friday, August 2nd in select cities. Our next film is named Slacker, and I, this is a sleeper that I enjoyed. It's a strange, fascinating, experimental film that takes place in and around the world of off-campus life in Austin, Texas. The method of the movie is to start with one character, follow him until he runs into somebody else, then follow the next character until he runs into somebody else, and so on, until eventually we've met dozens of different people. Instead of a story that goes from A to Z, this movie is constructed more like a pinball game that ricochets wildly from one person to the next. Have you seen Gary around? No. Does he still live in the same place? I told you, no one's seen him for months. Well, later. What was that, obsessiveness line again? Obsessiveness without personality. What are you talking about? Excuse me. Say, pal, did I hear you say you got a friend that's missing? Well, I doubt he's missing. He's just not around. Oh, yeah, well. I've been reading in the World Weekly News, you know, just a little while ago. There was a guy out here on the street. He's found wandering around, didn't know who he was, didn't know where he came from, anything like that. Oh, he's perfectly healthy, but he's a complete amnesiac, you know. A lot of people like that found uh, just wandering around lately. Everyone in this film seems to be consumed by a personal obsession, including this character, who claims to have the results of one of Madonna's medical tests. I know it's kind of cloudy. But it's a Madonna pap smear. It's got I know of only one other movie in film history that uses this same anti-narrative approach, and that would be Louis Benwell's 1974 masterpiece, The Phantom of Liberty. What both films do is remind us that although stories may have a beginning, a middle, and an end, the universe may not. It may be more accurately reflected as a series of coincidences, accidents, and chain reactions. Apart from that, I enjoyed Slacker simply because of the weird and eccentric people it contains, most of them non-stop talkers with bizarre theories. This movie is as close as you can get to the experience of listening in on every conversation in the off-campus neo Beatnik coffee shop all at once. Except that I think that if you listen into uh, the average coffee shop, I think you might find people that were more unintentionally funny and, and maybe some that were more interesting. I didn't think that the collection of people that he found were that interesting and that's mm -hmm. that's my problem with the picture i certainly after seeing so many boring movies forget going from a to z most movies we see go from a to b <laughs> i mean and so the spirit of the enterprise i appreciate tremendously in fact my favorite scene in the whole picture uh, is the last scene. It's probably your favorite, too, if, if you, lo you love movies, where the camera is, we'll put it this way, is in flight itself. Yeah. And I think that that's what the spirit of this movie is contained in that last sequence where a camera's being waved around and passed around. Um, but the people, I just, you know, I got well, a little, thought, they were grating on me. I thought a lot of the people were very funny. I, for example, very much like that sequence where the guy breaks in as a burglar and then is talked out of his crime by the guy he's going to rob who then takes him on a walk and explains to him the strange things that are See, happening. I don't know how... I like stuff like that. I think the film goes on a little too long, to tell you the truth. It, it wouldn't have gone and on... And that would okay. be my criticism okay. of it. But on the other hand, I think that it was very interesting just to watch it as it was going along. Well, I'll tell you, I enjoyed your review. When, I, seriously, I enjoyed your review more than I enjoyed the picture. Coming up next, our video pick of the week, a classic Mel Brooks comedy that you might not be familiar with. Triggered by Mel Brooks's new movie, Life Stinks, my video pick of the week is the best Mel Brooks comedy that you might not have heard of. Just as good, I think, as his biggest hits, Young Frankenstein and also Blazing Saddles. And I think it's as warm and as human as his new film, Life Stinks, would like to be. The picture I'm talking about is The Twelve Chairs. It's the story of a poor Russian man's hunt for a dozen chairs that contain a treasure. Ron Moody is desperate for the money, along with many others. The headlong dash for money is one of the constant themes in Brooks's work. He's never dealt with it more poignantly than in the 12 chairs, which is available on home video in just some storage. You're going to have to hunt around for it. If you can find it, get it. Now let's recap the movies we reviewed on this show. 
A split vote on V.I. Warshawski, the female private eye. There's nothing wrong with Kathleen Turner in the picture. I just didn't like the script or her co-stars. In other words, everything else. Roger thought it was fun. Two thumbs down for Hal Hartley's offbeat melodrama, Trust, with Adrian Shelley. The jokes are one note straight throughout the picture. Another split vote on Mel Brooks's new comedy about the homeless, Life Stinks. I didn't think it was tough enough or funny enough. Roger liked its warm-hearted humor. Two thumbs down for Mobsters, the all-star youthful gangster film that recycles mafia cliches for today's young moviegoers. And a split vote on the innovative slacker with its shaggy human stories. I didn't find the people very interesting. Roger thinks it's an intriguing experiment, and that, of course, it really is. That's it for this week. Next week, we'll be back with Doc Hollywood, a comedy starring Michael J. Fox as a plastic surgeon who gets trapped in a small town, and Hot Shots, a comedy starring Charlie Sheen. That's next week. And until then, the balcony is closed. Louisiana is specially blended for iced tea. That's why people who like iced tea love Louisiana. Available in regular or decaf. Pledge, still shining after 30 years. With no buildup and with its touchable shine, even smears just disappear. Plus, for quick dusting, there's new anti-static Pledge dusters. Rice Aroni, the San Francisco treat. Now with 30 flavors, you can serve it every day for a month and never serve the same dish twice. Did you know that Wesson Light cooking spray has less than one calorie per serving? Wesson Light, less than one calorie.